<laughs> Happy show day. Yes, it's Wednesday. How about that? Here we are. <laughs> I'm Lisa. I'm Jerry. And our top story today is how to buy an investment property this year. That's right. Go ahead and get started on that. I'm going to get us pulled up here so I can see our people. Okay. Location is always number one, always has been, always will be. Location determines your tenant profile. A tenant profile, how much money are my tenants going to make? You know, are they going to make $30,000 a year, $100,000 a year, $250,000 a year? That's a tenant profile. Yes. Oh, you... <laughs> well, no, I have a whole bunch of things here. I know you do. I didn't know. Uh... The other thing, that also, when I mean, you're looking at investment property, of course, location is number one. But um, who's there? Because the number one thing that drives your tenants is, um, are there jobs around there? Or are they college students? Are they vacationers? Like, what kind of uh, tenants are you going to have? Depends on where you are. Um, There's also low-income tenants, Section 8 tenants, you know, uh, tenants that are subsidized. Great tenants, not saying anything wrong with them. But, it, you know, it's a tenant profile. What are you looking for? Are you looking for, like Lisa said, student housing? Are you looking for luxury housing? Are you looking for everyday housing? Or are you looking to help out in affordable housing? Right. And then what state are you looking in as far as location? Are you looking near you in the state where you live or are you looking in a different state? It's going to have some different issues and trials if you're looking close to you or far away. Yeah, that's exactly right. Because in our area on coastal California, basically people are buying for property appreciation. The cap rate, which we'll get into that in a few minutes, uh, is going to be small or non-existent could even be a negative cap rate but your property appreciation is going to be where it's at when you say you know the way they've been coming up yeah well it it just it also has parts to do with what your goals are you looking for equity you looking for income that's right and investors usually start out looking for both well, everybody's going to be looking for both. Yeah, they want property <laughs> appreciation, income, rental increases. They want it all. I mean, you know, it's book after book. Um, everywhere you go, you know, it's buying a property, fixing it up, increasing the rents, refinancing the property, taking your original investment out, and then going to buy another property. That's kind of the system in place right now. People are very successful at it, but not everybody's successful at that one. The number, the second thing about working, uh, buying an investment property is who you work with. You need to work with professionals that can help you get this job done. That includes your real estate professional like us, your lender, and possibly your property manager if you're buying uh, far away, away from you or close to you. But if you've never done it before and you're buying your first investment property, especially in California, um, our tenant laws are very tenant friendly and they change all the time. So to stay on top of that as a first time um, investment property owner can be challenging. So we would usually recommend that you work with a professional property manager to keep you out of hot water. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. You don't want to say, oh, I didn't know that because I didn't know that it doesn't cover it if you're a landlord in California. That's kind of like the IRS, right? Yeah, yes. <laughs> I didn't know. Now we have figured out one way to be successful in investing in real estate and that's buying it and never selling it, you know? Mm -hmm. So even if you make a mistake going in and you hold it for 20 years, you know, when you look back in the mirror after you've been holding it for 20 years, it just doesn't look like a mistake at all. You, you look like a genius. All right. So don't wait to buy real estate, buy real estate and wait. <laughs> that's right. So the, the professional is going to, you know, not only help guide you to the right deal or find you the right deals, whether it's on market or off market, depending on where it's at, they're going to be very active in their community looking for the right property for you. And when they find it, then that's when the fun begins. Oh, yes. Um, and then the, number three is your budget. What is your budget? And keep in mind that if you're buying an investment property, you normally have to put at least 20% down if you're going to be non-owner occupying the property. So that's one of the things that is the hurdle to most people becoming a first-time investment property investor is the down payment. Yes, because, you know, they've got to not only qualify for 
the payments you're already making, then you have to qualify for the investment property. Now that's one to four units are all treated the same. So one to four units with a fourplex, triplex, duplex, they're all considered single family. That's right. So you do get some preferred um, rates. Now your rates on non-owner occupied property are going to be higher than if you're owner occupying the property, usually about a point higher, but the way the fees and rates are changing all the time. Um, but that's generally about what they are, depending on your credit score and your situation and your price range. Um, that's kind of what you can expect to pay. Yeah, depending on where you're buying. I mean, you know, we've seen duplexes as cheap as in some areas, 30 and 40,000. In our area, duplexes are going over a million. Mm -hmm. And the rents okay. really, go ahead. Well, and huge demand. So are you prepared in this market to pay um, over asking price and be ready with cash to pay if there's any delta on the appraisal? Um, the market for, the demand for multifamily is very, very, very hot. What we're doing right now is we're writing offers. We're waiving the appraisal contingency. A lot of times we're waiving any type of repair contingency that goes along with it. So then it all just comes down to price and the sellers are getting so many offers. But this is nationwide that you want to be competitive and you want to get your offer accepted. That's number one. Yeah. And we touched on demand. You know, what's your rental demand? Uh, to demand who's your tenant uh, gonna be. So you wanna make sure if you're buying in, a, in an area that you're not super familiar with, maybe out of state, that you know if there's a military base nearby that might be closing, um, if you have university nearby or a big company employer that is there now that might be moving or one that might be coming in. Uh, so like Tesla's moving to Austin. So I would think there's gonna be a huge de demand there even more for homes and rental property, um, just as an example. Oh, that's excellent. You know, Amazon's putting a lot of distribution centers, uh, you know, everywhere across mm -hmm. the United States. Now, one thing about Amazon, they don't manufacture anything. Where Tesla's manufacturing mm -hmm. cars, mm -hmm. Amazon's just bringing in products from all over the world and then just distributing throughout the United States. Mm -hmm. Um, and then do you have a cushion? What's your cushion plan? Because you need to make sure you have enough money in the bank if your tenants, if there's an unexpected repair, you have that, or it goes vacant for a couple of months and you need to cover your payment. You always need to have a cushion. And then what are your monthly expenses? Do you have to pay any of the utilities? Or do you have a gardener or a pool man or some uh, pest control or something that you're paying monthly for? You need to make sure that everything gets in your budget when you are looking at your numbers on buying a property. Yeah, I would think that the number one rate or the number one analytical tool that most investors use is capitalization rate or cap rate. And that's very simply is taking the uh, net operating income, the NOI, and dividing it by the sales price. So that gives you a cap rate uh, anywhere from zero, could be a negative number, to you know, 20, 30 percent. Average cap rate in our area is probably about a one. Uh, and it's area by area on what the cap rate is. So. That's the number one investor tool we see everybody use, and that's the one we use on just quick analyzing. One thing you don't want to miss when you're calculating the cap rate is stuff like if you're part of an HOA, you know, trash, any type of repairs that need to be done. So you want to include all that in there. What we found works for us is if we want to take on the expenses, the let's say the low end side of things would be 40%. And it normally averages around 50% of the income goes towards expenses. Yeah, I mean, you want to, your goal is about a 10% return per year is your goal. Like that would be, you know, awesome. Difficult to achieve, I think, <laughs> but you can always have a goal, right? So you want to try and get 10% return per year, and you can expect to pay about 1% of the value of the property per year in maintenance. No, that's, that's totally spot on. And it's nice to have goals. People that had goals two or three years ago, I think they've met all their expectations mm -hmm. on what's available to them just based on the appreciation of properties across the country. Mm -hmm. 
Get on to your, we have some <laughs> vocabulary we're going to teach you here. <laughs> well, we did. I, uh, cash on cash return, uh, another handy calculation you can use that's just going to take, you know, your return on your investment. That's if you put down 20%, what's your, that's your cash in, then what's your return on that cash. So that works when you're financing a property. The capitalization rate or cap rate works. It's not taking any financing into consideration. And then the best one, the total return on investment or ROI, that's where you take everything and you get to uh, get out your crystal ball. You get to say, hey, it's gonna go up X amount of percent next year, that we're gonna incre increase rents next year to this. We're gonna do, uh, probably put off some capital improvement projects for a year or two. And then that is a fascinating number because your tenants are paying down your mortgage. That's all taken into consideration. And you also consider taxes on your total return on investment or your ROI. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you always want to keep in mind when you're lo looking at investment property, what the current rents are and what the projected market rents are. Well, unless you have a really good crystal ball, you don't necessarily know what the projected market rents are. And they tend to be maybe a little exaggerated. So we always like to err on the side of conservative numbers on your projected rents. Because uh, more important, at least to us, than the rent is having a good, t a good tenant. Because every time a tenant leaves, it costs you a lot of money to turn it. So it just does. By the time you repair things and you have it vacant, um, it's easier to keep the tenant. If you have a good tenant in there, then necessarily raise the rent. Correct. And it's the amount of time a tenant stays, the longest tenant stay in single family housing, the shortest tenant stay in studio apartments. And it's kind of everything in between. That's just the way it works out, generally speaking. Mm -hmm. So you have any questions about um, investing in investment property? We love to talk about it. We are landlords. We have lots of experience and would love to talk to you and answer your questions about it. That's right. You can find us at GaryandLisa.com. Your real estate edge. Thanks, guys.